your guardianship. And Abby, if you'll let me know if that looks okay. <clears throat> yes, looks good. Uh, so, just like Abby said, my name is Thomas Nichols. Uh, I direct uh, all of the legal and advocacy services here at Disability Rights Arkansas. So, we are a nonprofit organization that receives about a little less than a dozen federal grants. Uh, and through that, we are authorized to uh, investigate incidents of abuse or neglect, to advocate on behalf of individuals with disabilities, and to provide legal representation uh, according to our priorities and objectives. We work in a lot of different areas. Um, we provide representation to folks in vocational rehabilitation services. Uh, we provide special education representation. Uh, we, we represent individuals under guardianship, which we'll talk about today. Uh, we audit representative payees under the Social Security program. So we've got a very broad uh, list of, of not just the different types of disabilities that we can represent for a host of things, but also uh, different areas and uh, specific services that we can assist folks with, uh, with getting. So <clears throat> guardianship is, uh, it really is on something that I like to call a continuum of decision-making supports. And so uh, that will be next slide here. Um, of course, the, the very basic decision making is uh, is the person, right? As it's an individual, they're making decisions on their own. Uh, we all do it every day. But on this continuum of, of decision making, the person is the very uh, the very basic decision making uh, point. Uh, you, you could see as we go through it, uh, the different ways that an individual can be supported in making their decisions goes all the way from somebody making their own choice all the way up to uh, full, general, permanent, uh, plenary guardianship. Uh, and so all these different stops along the way, we'll talk a little bit about later on in, in the session, but uh, they're all limiting uh, somebody's ability to make decisions, whether it's giving that decision-making authority over to somebody else, but maintaining all of your decision-making authority, um, or uh, just having somebody assist you in making decisions, and also limited in the, in the areas in which they're providing assistance. So guardianship, it's been around for a very, very long time. Um, and it has, as you would expect, it has aged uh, differently in different parts of the world. Um, it originated as part of this parents patria authority uh, that existed in, uh, in ancient Rome. And that just is, is fancy Latin for uh, the government will have authority and, uh, and control over individuals who are not able to protect themselves. Uh, and the original intent uh, was in order to not only prevent uh, burden uh, on the community itself and uh, also necessarily on the government at times, but this private type of guardianship was established to ensure uh, protection of inheritance of, of the, the landed folks. So they... Uh, its original intent was uh, to make sure that uh, that wealth could be passed safely uh, from one to another. And uh, as it's developed in different countries, uh, we have seen that some have become more restrictive in some areas, uh, and some have become far less restrictive and, and far more granting of individual rights, especially in European countries. So there are there are some good. I, I don't want to uh, give the impression that I think all guardianship should go away no matter what. There are some good parts of guardianship. It does offer protections and safeguards against abuse. Uh, it gives some type of of standard for decision making. You know, when it comes to uh, financial authorities of a guardianship, then it. Uh, 
it requires uh, a fiduciary duty in that capacity. Um, it allows a uh, an independent decision maker to make decisions about uh, some very specific things that we'll talk about in a little bit, one of which is institutionalization. Uh, and it creates less ambiguity. It, it removes any ambiguity about who's going to make the decision. You know, we've we've heard uh, lots of cases where uh, different family members have different ideas about what an individual does or does not want if they can make if they cannot make decisions for themselves. So one of the ideas is that we need to know who is going to make the decisions so that we're not having to decide uh, based on each specific instance. Uh, who is going to be the person in charge if it's not going to be the individual themselves? And also, we as lawyers like predictability, right? So it, as third parties, you're now given some certainty about who is making that decision so that you can rely on that person having the authority to make their decisions. And it, just go, it doesn't just go for lawyers, but, you know, folks who make contracts with individuals, um, any type of service, you want that reliance that the individual with whom you're dealing has the authority to do uh, to make the decision that that you want them to make. There are bad parts of guardianship. Okay, so it is it is a loss of legal personhood. You are no longer necessarily an independent person under the law. It, it has been called a, a civil death in many in many venues. Um, you don't have the right anymore, depending on how uh, how general or how plenary your guardianship is. You can't make decisions about what health care you're going to get, who your doctor is, where you live, who you will associate with. Uh, in some cases, we have we have advocated for folks because they wanted their hair cut in a certain way and their guardian absolutely would not let them cut their hair in that way. And you know, it's very small things that you would think would not be a point of contention uh, does wear on somebody's, uh, somebody's dignity and their own self-worth. So that loss of the right to make their own decisions uh, just increases their reliance and dependence uh, on the on the decision maker, and folks are denied the dignity of risk, right? So we we overlook that a lot uh, in favor of ultimate uh, safety, right? Safety at all cost. We uh, we would rather somebody be safe and sound, uh, despite the lack of of uh, the ability to try new things, to test limits, to take risks, right? And so if it's not something that will be harmful to an individual, if it's not something that will compromise their safety, then that dignity of risk is an important part of learning and ultimately of independence. We are we are permitted as people who are not under guardianship to make all sorts of horrible decisions and uh, nobody questions whether uh, we are required to have a guardian based on those decisions i could spend all of my entire paycheck on candy if i wanted to but it doesn't mean that i uh, I, I should be denied the dignity of risk of what happens when that occurs So guardianship here in Arkansas comes from uh, comes from our code, right? So it, it is a statutory function of uh, is a whole set of laws that govern guardianships, how they're created, what the standards are for obtaining a guardianship, how one is terminated, all falls underneath uh, the guardianship code, which is uh, 2865 uh, 101 as a whole whole uh, subchapter 65 or a whole chapter 65 is about guardianships generally. So let's start by talking about incapacity. We hear a term a lot. Uh, it is called incompetency. And the standard in Arkansas is not one that has existed for 100 years uh, is that term of incompetent. We have we've gotten rid of that language used to describe a person. And I think it's a better 
it, it's a better word for it because an individual is not necessarily incompetent because they are incapacitated. And certainly an individual can be incapacitated for a period of time. So it, it gives a better uh, uh understanding i think to all to use the phrase incapacity because they are without capacity whether it's momentarily whether it's permanent uh it can be by a number of different reasons so the first thing that you have to know is incapacitated is they have a mental illness they have a mental deficiency they have a physical illness or they have a chronic use of drugs or chronic intoxication uh, that causes them to lack of sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate decisions to meet the essential requirements of his or her health or safety or to manage his or her estate. Now, that is a mouthful, but the short of it is that if an individual is able to communicate decisions, in order to meet the essential requirements of their safety or their health or their estate in those three areas, then they don't necessarily have to uh, be able to make those decisions. Uh, if they can make those decisions, uh, if they require some type of accommodation in order to be able to communicate it to somebody, whether that's uh, talking through a third party or using augmented communication, uh, we want to be very careful uh, that it is make or communicate decisions. So uh, the definition is, uh, is it should be a very tough one to meet without having a professional evaluation, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it is definitely not a decision, uh, a definition that an, individ that an individual can meet just based on Having, uh, having interviewed them or that a fact finder can make without the support of some type of uh, professional who's qualified to evaluate somebody. Different types of guardianship. Okay, so it, the most common one we see is what's called a permanent plenary guardianship. And permanent means, you know, it's not going to be temporary, obviously. And plenary means that it is for every decision that that individual makes. Uh, but the law specifically divides it into these two different categories. Uh, you can be a guardian of the person and or you can be a guardian of the estate. And there are some crossovers between those two areas. Um, and we only, we only really encounter this when we have very specific strange cases that we get walked through our doors. And uh, a, a good example is we uh, consulted with an individual who wanted to be able to uh, communicate with whomever he wants to communicate with. And he's very adamant about that. I want to be able to have friends. I want to be able to communicate with them. I want to, I want to be able to call them on the phone specifically. Uh, he did not, he did not have a guardian of his, uh, of his estate. He had a guardian of his person. And so as the guardian of the person, they wanted to be able to restrict who he communicated with. But since he had control over his own finances and was able to make decisions about his own finances, he kept buying phones. And the guardian could not prohibit him from going out and buying those phones. So he wasn't sure why he was, he was, he was uh, intelligent enough and uh, uh, contemplative enough to understand that, well, I have the ability to go buy my phone and pay my phone bill, but they're able to tell me who I can talk to on my phone. It doesn't make any sense. So there are strange crossovers that exist. Um, guardian of the person is uh, basically anything that doesn't have anything to do with finances. It has to do with your health decisions. It has to do with education decisions. It has to do with where you live and indeed also who you communicate with and associate with. Uh, estate is just that. Attached to a guardian of the estate is a fiduciary duty. Uh, so you do have to make sure that you are not, if you are a guardian, you're prepared to file accountings of what you're spending uh, on the ward and what uh, uh, be able to justify that it was for their benefit. 
all of the rights that are uh, that are impacted by guardianship. I mean, there's a lot of them. There's voting, marriage, uh, where you go, where you live, how you handle your money, healthcare decisions, who you can contract with, you know, whether you can buy a car. Um, all of those are rights that are impacted by guardianship. I'm not sure if I go into this later in the session, but it is worth noting that voting has only in the past 20 years become an issue. Um, up to the year 2001, a guardian was uh, had to go to court in order to be able to forbid an individual under guardianship from voting. And in 2001, uh, we reversed that. And uh, now there is a presumption, there is an automatic uh, restriction of the right to vote. Uh, and there's no good standard for how to get that back. A, an individual would have to go to court in order to have their right to vote reinstated. But just by virtue of being under guardianship, they no longer have that right to vote. Uh, so you can get a temporary guardianship, uh, but you have to show that there is imminent danger, right? And they can't be for very long. They can't exceed 90 days unless it's extended by an agreement. Uh, it can happen with or without notice. So there can be an ex parte hearing. Um, sometimes we have seen that you, you do not even need to present any kind of uh, evidence that the individual is incapacitated from a professional, but that an individual can just go get temporary guardianship over somebody with the knowledge that uh, it will have to have a hearing within a, a very limited amount of time uh, in order to determine if it should continue. So the permanent guardianship function uh, there is a requirement that a court has to determine not just the extent of an individual's incapacity, but also what are some of those less restrictive alternatives that we can use instead of guardianship? Uh, you know, can we use the power of attorney for this? Can we, uh, can we engage in some type of supported decision-making authority? Can we, can we do any of these other uh, uh, processes in order to ensure that the individual is not unduly restricted from uh, from making their own decisions. So, a court's supposed to specify uh, exactly what the uh, what the guardian should have the authority to do, uh, all limitations and the duty and the authorities that they have uh, under the guardianship. It is not something that we see very often that there is a careful consideration of less restrictive alternatives, but it is very clear in the statute that the court must consider uh, things that are less than guardianship, even limiting the guardianship. If an individual is having difficulty making decisions about a particular area of their life, then it can be a guardianship that is limited to just that area. Because it is such a um, a massive restriction on an individual's right, they have very specific due process rights that arise uh, in a proposed guardianship. So uh, through the process of examining whether somebody needs a guardianship and making findings, a person who is proposed to be under a guardianship, they have to have notice, right? We know that they have to be served. Um, they have to be served not just with a copy of the petition, uh, but they have to be served with a copy of the Ward's Bill of Rights, which we'll go through a little later. Um, they have the right to counsel. Uh, now, the law is not super clear as, as to exactly when that right to counsel exists. And they don't have a right to appointed counsel. So the court, in its discretion, may nominate an ad litem uh, to represent the best interests of the individual. Uh, but the individual's best interest might not always dovetail with what that individual wants. Uh, and the perception of best interest is, is different from person to person based on uh, uh, training and experience. So that right to counsel 
is, it, it can be a little shaky depending on what the authorities of that council are. And also, it is not abundantly clear in the statute uh, whether that right to counsel is just at the guardianship hearing or whether it's at any hearing. Um, so we will we will talk a little bit about how that might uh, be evaluated a bit later on. So one of those rights, one of those due process protections is the evaluations, right? And Arkansas is pretty specific on who is qualified to conduct those evaluations. It has to be uh, a uh, a medical doctor or a, a physician, I think is how it's worded, or a clinical psychologist or a licensed certified social worker. And out of those three professions, uh, you have to select one of them in order to do this evaluation that has to exist. And it, Arkansas it does a fairly good job compared to some other states on being specific on what that evaluation has to include. And something that we always almost always see is deficient in guardianships where we are asked to intervene by the ward. Um, they have to go over the individual's medical and physical condition. They have to evaluate the person's intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior. And then they have to recommend areas that the individual needs assistance and the least restrictive alternatives available. And so now we know from earlier, a court's required to consider in rendering a decision about guardianship and whether it's necessary, these least restrictive alternatives. And we see it pop up uh, in this one, in this part of the, uh, of the code again, where we have to now have an evaluation of what least restrictive alternatives are available. And while other states list out what those less restrictive alternatives are, what actually are alternatives to guardianship, um, ours does not. It just, uh, it puts the onus on uh, the guardian, the evaluator, uh, and the judge to decide what less restrictive alternatives are even, um, are even a possibility, much less more appropriate. Let me go back real quick. Um, so the law doesn't require necessarily a, um, a standardized IQ test. That's what an evaluation of intellectual functioning would be. Uh, so we have, uh, we've been very clear in the cases that we have handled that it specifically requires an evaluation of adaptive behavior and intellectual functioning. And those are very specific standardized evaluations that can occur. So why not engage in a type of testing that gives us a more objective evaluation of an individual's actual intellectual functioning and their actual adaptive behavior. Um, and we have seen, uh, we have seen not just, not just courts, but also guardians are typically willing to, when they haven't had one in the first place, uh, are willing to have a more comprehensive evaluation. But what are the duties of a guardian? So they have to they have to care for and maintain uh, the person over whom they're a guardian, and that is uh, that is kind of vague when it comes to guardian of the person. Um, there are some extra requirements if the ward is a minor. Uh, they do put an obligation on a guardian. Uh, to see that the that the minor is educated and trained and have the opportunity to engage in in employment, um, and so it is uh, it is basically substituted decision making uh, of an individual about everything except property. Now uh, there are more requirements for folks who are guardians of the estate. They like we said they had a they have a fiduciary duty that exists. They have to exercise due care. And, you know, in a lot of circumstances, unless the court says that an accounting is not necessary, they have to account for that property uh, on, a, on an annual basis and file those accountings with the court uh, unless um, ordered otherwise. Uh, and that has caused us to see some courts, sua sponte, uh, just dismiss guardianships when nobody has filed an accounting or responded to uh, communications from the court. Let's talk about oversight because you know some less restrictive alternatives to guardianship 
do not have this court oversight. And so we need to know exactly what that oversight is, how effective it is, um, in order to really have a comfort level of, of if that oversight is going to be necessary for, uh, for a guardian uh, to, to effectively uh, discharge their duties. So if the court wants, uh, it can ask for a, it can require a bond uh, so that you know nobody is is uh, is stealing from the ward. It can require these inventories. Uh, it can ask for accountings either of the estate or the person. Uh, two very two very different things. Uh, the court can require uh, an update from the guardian on an annual basis about you know is the ward in school? Is the ward working? How is their health? Um, and then, you know, there is an opportunity for review. They are in large part public record. Uh, and so uh, if we are advised of an individual who's under a guardianship and we see that there's not been an accounting filed in, in 10 years, despite orders indicating that it should be, and the ward is telling us that they're abused, we, we have the right to go in there and and ask the court to review it. The ward themselves uh, themselves do. So uh, there is that opportunity for review and oversight. I do see a question: Is is a guardian financially responsible for the ward, or liable for debts of or judgments against the ward? It's a very good question. Um, it's tough to put all of the. Uh, all of the decision making on uh, on a guardian when they are uh, when an individual doesn't have the authority to make financial decisions themselves, um, I, it does not necessarily make the guardian financially responsible for the debts that the ward incurs unless the guardian authorized them to be incurred or if the uh, if the guardian, I suppose, later on uh, consents to those debts occurring, uh, but there is uh, there is a little bit of a question uh, then about um, maybe pre-existing judgments. Of course, they wouldn't be liable for that either. Uh, so the estate is going to be separate from the guardian. So would the ward's estate be responsible for it and thus the uh, the guardian have to discharge that debt? Yeah, out of the ward's estate. But if the ward does not have an estate that can meet the judgment, then I don't think that the ward is personally liable unless there was some type of fiduciary mismanagement on their own. And I hope that answers your question. My My answer was kind of winding and I apologize for that. Uh, so let's talk about the rights of wards. We uh, we originally um, had a very specific statute. I called it the Casey Kasem statute because it was um, it came out of uh, an an issue with Casey Kasem uh, from the Weekly Top Forty. Uh, he became significantly disabled. Uh, he uh, did not have. Uh, decision-making ability and uh, I believe it might have been dementia uh, and his family uh, became significantly at odds with one another. I, I believe it was his, his wife obtained guardianship over Casey Kasem and would not let uh, other members of the family communicate with him and uh, moved him off to uh, a place that was that was away from the family um, and they had to go to court over it. And ever since then, uh, they his family has been going from state to state, uh, proposing legislation to ensure that individuals with guardianship, that individuals under guardianship, had the right to associate with people of their choosing. Uh, and I thought it was a very, very strong uh, observation of an individual's rights while they're under guardianship, because if the guardian did not want a ward to communicate with somebody specific, they were required to go to court and have the court order 
uh, that they not be able to communicate with a person. Uh, we we don't have that statute anymore. It's modified, but it is uh, it is replaced with <clears throat> a broader set of uh, of rights for folks. Um, and I will talk about that on the next slide. But it used to be that that we had that individuals under guardianship had this right to associate with persons of their choosing. And uh, just a statement that they retain all legal rights except those that are limited by the court. So if a court does a limited guardianship for whatever reason or details the decision-making authority of the guardian, then there is nothing about the finding of incapacity or guardianship that is going to restrict any rights that are not mentioned. Uh, the follow-up to the question earlier, what if the ward runs out of money before they run out of month? Is the guardian legally responsible to make up the difference? So this might be a, a um, uh, kind of a collision of possibly two different authorities that might exist. So there is uh, a obligation as a representative payee through Social Security, which is less restrictive than a guardianship. And that puts certain obligations on the representative payee to handle the ward's money um, that's provided to uh, the ward through Social Security. And so there's a lot of different regulations that discuss that what the representative payee can and can't spend money on, how they have to handle those finances. Um, and those are all governed by Social Security under the POMS. I'm not sure what it, stand, what it stands for, but uh, P-O-M-S for Social Security purposes. Now, if you, have, if you are a guardian over somebody and you're guardian of their estate and the ward runs out of money before they run out of months, as your question states, uh, then I, you would have to wonder whether the guardian has faithfully discharged their duty as guardian of the estate and that fiduciary duty in budgeting for the ward. Um, so I, I don't know about ultimate responsibility for any of those debts incurred, uh, but if the ward is controlling uh, how they are spending their money, uh, it it does kind of raise the question of uh, whether they need a guardian uh, in the first place, w what their guardian is exactly doing if the ward is able to spend their own money in a way that puts them uh, into debt. So uh, we now have a, as of 2021, so very, very new, uh, we now have a codified rights of wards. OK, so uh, it's called the Ward's Bill of Rights. It's, I mentioned earlier that uh, individuals have to be served with it uh, prior to uh, a guardianship being granted, prior to a hearing. Uh, it says that they, again, retain all legal and civil rights. Uh, they have the right to communication with individuals. However, uh, instead of the, the pre 2021 statute that required the guardian to go to court, the onus is now on the ward that if the guardian wants to restrict their communication, the guardian must communicate with them and tell them that they're going to restrict their communication. Now the ward has the responsibility of going to court, but the guardian has to help them with that. Um, I, uh, I disagree that the onus should be on the ward uh, in that in that matter because uh, uh, how many how many guardians are, are going to uh, faithfully assist their ward with taking them to court to uh, ensure that they have communication? Uh, are they going to retain them counsel? There's a lot of unanswered questions on what that might mean um, and whether that really is an observation of a right because of that. Uh, they have a right to every every piece of paper associated with their guardianship. If they want to see accountings, they're entitled to it. If they want the pleadings, they can have them. <clears throat> they want a copy of their evaluations. They're entitled to it. It goes on. Uh, so they have these great new rights that didn't exist prior to a couple of years ago that includes a guardianship that encourages independence with a goal of termination, if that's possible. 
So that's that's great. It's something that didn't exist uh, prior to a couple of years ago. Um, before the, codific the, the codified uh, rights of the wards, they didn't have to consider uh, personal preferences. You know, go back to the, the specific situation I mentioned earlier where an individual wanted to cut their hair in a certain way. Well, is it really a consideration of their personal preferences if you're requiring them to cut their hair in a way that they don't want to? Uh, they have a right to a hearing on just about any matter they want, even the ultimate issue of whether they need a guardianship anymore. Now, you would think that they would have a right to that anyway, but it was not expressly spelled out in the statutes before uh, the uh, this codified rights of wards existed. So uh, very good uh, ability to give a a hook to a ward to get back into court if they're able to uh, and expressly uh, allow consideration of their preferences that just was not in existence. This is something that is, uh, parts of it are a bit overlooked, um, not in this statute so much, but there are decisions that require court approval that uh, that you you cannot make these decisions to uh, on behalf of the ward, including you know experimental procedures. You can't authorize termination of parental rights. Um, again, you can't allow the individual to vote without going to court. All, all of these can be overturned by uh, by going to court and having a fact finder make the determination that the guardian. Uh, Guardian may authorize an experimental procedure or may authorize termination of parental rights can, you know, have them sterilized if they if they want to. But you have to have a court uh, decide that for you. We talk a little bit about uh, institutionalization before I uh, answer the next question. But institutionalization is another one. Um, you have to go to court and get the court to authorize institutionalization, whether it's in a psychiatric hospital, uh, anything other than a commitment at the Arkansas State Hospital. Um, you have to go to court to do it. Uh, that includes in a uh, intermediate care facility, in a human development center, in um, a long-term uh, care facility, uh, there is not a good standard for when that is appropriate uh, that would give a court an understanding of how they're going to make this big decision for an individual. But it does require court approval. It's not something that we see happen uh, very often at all. Uh, typically, uh, they're just permitted to uh, place the person over whom they have guardianship into an institution. Uh, as long as the institution agrees to it. But by law, it should happen through uh, through authorization from the court. Question, if the ward petitions the court to terminate their guardianship, can the ward successfully request an award of attorney's fees from the guardian? That is a wonderful question. Um, we don't do that. Uh, I. I don't think that you would be able to recover attorney's fees only because I haven't ever tried to do it. There are under certain circumstances where if you are challenging a guardianship based on the evaluation and there is not an evaluation, uh, the court must order an evaluation. And if that happens, um, if the guardianship is granted, that it comes out of the estate of the ward. If the guardianship is not granted as a result of the evaluation, then the guardian has to pay for it. Um, that's by statute, but I do not believe that there's a mechanism that would allow a ward to recover attorney's fees only, only because I'm not sure. Um, so I'm, I regret that I can't answer that question. Uh, how can a guardian be removed? Well, it, so there's a difference between removing a guardian and terminating a guardianship, right? Removing a guardian doesn't necessarily mean that an individual doesn't need a guardianship, uh, even though it would leave uh, would leave the court with some 
some very big questions about, okay, we're, we're going to remove this guardian because the guardian is no longer doing their job or they're abusing uh, the ward um, or, or they've died. You know, perhaps the guardian has died. We can remove that guardian. Um, it is always a good idea to ask the individual under guardianship who they want to be a successor guardian. Is there anybody they trust to make their own decisions for them? Um, but for all of these reasons, uh, a guardian can be removed. Mismanagement of the estate is is one that we don't see very often, but I'm sure that it happens. Um, now that we have these rights that exist uh, under the Ward's Bill of Rights, uh, it's very arguable that uh, failing to perform any duty imposed by law or by lawful order of any court might mean the observation of those very important rights that exist uh, for an individual who doesn't have very many rights anymore. So termination, on the other hand, uh, it requires a finding that not just uh, is the guardianship no longer necessary, but also is the guardianship no longer in the best interest of the ward. Separately from that, you have to, uh, the court will have to adjudicate whether or not the ward has capacity. I think they actually say in the statute, uh, the ward's competency, but uh, again, it, it kind of goes back and forth in the guardianship code between capacity and competency. Uh, another question, under the ward's rights, how is the term significant decisions determined and defined? Uh, as we sit here right now, I don't know that it is. I don't know that it is defined. Um, I think that uh, in some areas, it is the, is where they live, uh, is um, uh, from whom they get medical care, uh, but I don't know that it's given a really good definition. I think that it's it's extremely broad, and that that might be purposeful. So if capacity is restored, um, if anybody alleges in writing uh, under oath, so on an affidavit, if anybody alleges in writing that an individual under guardianship has capacity, uh, the court has to cause the facts to be inquired into. Um, so this essentially allows an individual under guardianship to allege under oath in writing. I have capacity. I would like the court to inquire into the facts and, uh, and tell me if I still need to continue having a guardianship. And so um, that is one way uh, if you do not have a, an individual who is uh, is qualified and has evaluated an individual and deemed that they have uh, that they have capacity, but uh, the ward uh, in whatever circumstance believes that they have capacity and you don't have any reason to dispute that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there is nothing in this that restricts a ward from executing that type of statement on their own and cause the court to have to uh, at least inquire into it. Um, we're, we're back to the continuum of decision-making supports. And we talked a little bit about less restrictive alternatives because it was mentioned in the law a couple of times. And we see there are a lot of jumps between the individual making the decision and uh, uh, permanent plenary guardianship. You know, we can limit guardianships in a lot of ways. There's such a thing as a substitute decision maker. We brief, I briefly mentioned representative payees. If an individual is a social security rep uh, recipient, they can authorize any individual to, uh, to make their financial decisions for them and manage their social security funds. Now there's a whole host of obligations that goes along with that but that allows an individual to be authorized to make financial decisions without taking decision-making authority away elsewhere. And indeed, we have seen, um, even our Office of Public Guardian, where an individual has a representative payee, they are, they are watched so closely and have reporting authorities to Social Security uh, that uh, they have made an effort in the past few years at terminating uh, their uh, they're purely uh, the estate side of the guardianships so that they can retain uh, uh, guardianship over the person 
but since there is this mechanism of oversight for the representative payees, they don't see the need anymore for them to exercise estate guardianship. And it's essentially duplicating that effort anyway. So the court's allowed to limit its guardianship in whatever ways it can. You know, it could talk about specific powers that the guardian should have, uh, specific uh, ways that they can exercise their decision-making authority. Um, you know, it can, the court could essentially do exactly what Social Security does and give them representative payee obligations to the court in the same way that it does to Social Security. But uh, we will typically just see this broad uh, permanent plenary general guardianship uh, that is um, that is almost formulaic uh, that just awards all decision making to the uh, to the guardian and oftentimes it's because there's not an individual speaking up on their behalf. So let's talk. We've done this overview of guardianship, and I could talk for hours and hours about this. But why should you help? Uh, so we have individuals under guardianship, they have this right to representation, but if they cannot find anybody to represent them, uh, it is utterly meaningless. There's no, there's no requirement that the court must appoint uh, ad litem attorneys uh, to represent these individuals. And uh, we only have uh, me and one other attorney in our office right now who are representing individuals under guardianship. And so it's very, it's very uh, rare that an individual has an opportunity uh, for counsel. Um, it should be really hard to get guardianship over somebody. You're extinguishing legal personhood. Um, so the number of times we have seen a guardianship uh, be granted uh, without even an apparent evaluation in the first place. I'm talking about a permanent guardianship be granted without the appearance of an evaluation is staggering. Um, and we need to be showing courts the value of less restrictive alternatives. You know, when somebody can make their own decisions, um, I'll get into this in a, in a little bit if we have time, but there are better health outcomes for individuals who are making their own guardianships. Uh, national core indicators uh, uh, find repeatedly in their evaluations of the states that folks who are not under guardianship are more likely to report abuse. They're more likely to live in a community. They're more likely to seek preventative health care. They're more likely to take uh, uh, take charge of their own decisions about working. Uh, so it, it should be a difficult thing, and it should be something that we really think hard about uh, less restrictive alternatives to might be that might be available. Ethically, this will come up, but I do have a question. If the Social Security Administration has already made a determination that a guardian misappropriated funds, have you seen a court grant additional damages to the ward? I have not. Uh, I would be very interested to uh, see a case in which a uh, Social Security Administration has uh, has determined mismanagement or misuse or theft. Um, if there is a bond, uh, then I would I would expect that uh, they would be able to recover against that. If there's mismanagement, then the bond protects against that. Um, I would not be surprised if uh, a ward would be able to recover against a guardian for mismanagement of, of their estate. Um, I do believe that the, given the fiduciary duty, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to. Let's talk about ethical considerations because we're talking about representing folks who, you know, may or may not have capacity, right? And so we we uh, think about this all the time in our office because we do. We're, you know, on the one hand, we are authorized by the federal government to represent folks with disabilities, so we have that that added bit of of latitude in in providing representations to folks, uh, but. As attorneys, we also had this ethical rule um, that requires us to uh, uh, consider somebody's capacity when we are becoming their their attorney. So, uh, first of all, there is no 
legal or social science literature on representing a client who has uh, been judicially determined to lack legal capacity and whose rights have been delegated to a guardian. Um, there's not anything that provides really good guidance in this. Um, but our ethical rules do contemplate representation of individuals with diminished capacity. It requires us to have this normal attorney-client relationship to the extent we can, uh, and it even lets us make decisions on their behalf when, uh, when we expect that an individual is in grave danger uh, or their personal safety or health is at risk. Um, so are rights violations necessarily going to rise to that level? If we believe that the guardian is acting adverse to a ward's interest, we as attorneys, regardless of the level of capacity, have the ability to go in and try to protect that ward if we can. Um, this is our rule uh, 1.14 uh, of the uh, rules of professional conduct is part of the model rules of professional conduct. Um, and so we adopted that. Uh, the the uh, all of the scholars that we have we have engaged to advise us on this topic and and uh, law review articles all endorse representing folks who are under guardianship from the ethical perspective. Um, so whether or not an attorney can represent a person who is currently under a guardianship really depends on whether the client has been uh, stripped of the right to pursue that matter. And we definitely don't have that in our state. This is let me just on the next slide. So uh, people under guardianship, they have the right to representation at the hearing. Like I said, it wasn't really clear at the hearing. Does it mean the hearing for establishing the guardianship or not? But presumably, uh, the uh, there should be that right to counsel if you have the right to a hearing. And we know that they have the right to hearing on a great number of things. So not only is there this, this legal authority that authorizes us to represent folks who are under guardianship, there's a due process reason for it, right? So uh, giving somebody the right to go to court uh, should necessarily carry with it the right to be represented by counsel. Um, and it would be fundamentally unfair not to permit representation, and especially not representation of one's own choice. Um, so just, we don't have much precedent in the state of Arkansas, okay? So uh, very few times are you going to see uh, a Supreme Court opinion or a Court of Appeals opinion expressly on guardianship uh, when it pertains to representation by counsel. Um, the closest we have come is that uh, this, this older case, 1987, explicitly uh, allows a individual standing to attack their own guardianship. So if they're permitted to do that at any point after having been uh, uh, placed under a guardianship, why then would we think that they're not entitled to representation? They might not be entitled to appointment of counsel, but they should certainly be entitled to representation. Um, anybody can request an ad litem, though. Uh, so uh, you don't even necessarily need to be uh, a party to the case. So um, a court may appoint an ad litem in any circumstance. You know, we have advised attorneys of this when it's not a case that we may accept, uh, but they they need assistance, technical assistance on this issue. And I always tell them to uh, move for an appointment of a guardian ad litem or of, of, a, of an attorney ad litem uh, in order to uh, further the interests of the ward where they can. Um, a, a very relevant question to this topic, under what circumstances, if any, must the court appoint counsel? Now, the court is not required to appoint counsel um, because an individual requests it. And I do not know that under any circumstances, the court would have to appoint counsel, but the court may, in its discretion, appoint counsel uh, for an individual. Um, 
I would hope that if an individual is present at a hearing uh, and really wants to contest their guardianship and voices that opinion at the hearing, uh, that the judge would would uh, carefully consider appointing counsel, either appointing private counsel or appointing ad litem. Because again, there's this difference between uh, what an ad litem is permitted to do and what private counsel might be permitted to do. And it goes back to this question of uh, representation of individuals and that this ethical question that exists. And are you representing the person's best interest like an ad litem would do? Uh, or are you representing the person's actual interest, the person's, uh, the person's stated interest, the person's desires? Are you furthering your client's agenda? And uh, we, we have the latitude to always take that position uh, of furthering our client's agenda, uh, as it's very clear from part of our, part of our federal mandate. But it, it really should be a consideration that anybody is, who is representing somebody who has diminished capacity really carefully consider uh, if this person is able to discuss with you their decisions that they want to make, why they want to make their own decisions, you do not have to determine capacity or incapacity. You just have to determine whether or not you're going to be able to have a typical attorney-client relationship with them and whether they're in danger before you, you can start making decisions about their uh, about what is or is not their best interest. But I, I went a long way around that, but back to your question, appointing counsel, the court's not going to be required to appoint counsel, but I do uh, I do think that there are plenty of circumstances where uh, where a court would feel urged to appoint counsel, or at least I would hope. So some we talked about guardianship reform in our state. Um, elsewhere, uh, some states have made guardianship harder to get. Um, they have required them in other states to try uh, less restrictive alternatives and fail in some way before actually engaging in a full guardianship. Um, other states have had this appointment of counsel, uh, removing the discretion of a court of whether counsel should be appointed. Uh, and it, it varies uh, with, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but we have seen uh, scenarios in which uh, a law requires that if somebody suggests to the court that an individual ought to have representation, the court must appoint counsel for that individual. Uh, that's that's uh, that's very uh, it's a very interesting way to determine whether or not somebody should be appointed counsel. We've seen a right to counsel in every issue of guardianship. Uh, we've seen offices in states, uh, actual state offices set up just to represent individuals who are going under guardianship. And little known fact, I am not sure if it still exists as of the last general session, but uh, as of that point, our public defender statute, where it delineates the duties that they have, actually expressly says that public defenders uh, must represent people uh, proposed to be under guardianship. And that is, it is fascinating. It is something that uh, nobody seems to, to mention much, uh, but it's something that we do not see happen very often. So Title II and Olmstead issues. So Olmstead, um, uh, versus LC is a uh, Americans with Disabilities Act Title II uh, case against a uh, against the state. You know, the Title II of the ADA governs uh, whether a state may discriminate against an individual with a disability and prohibits such discrimination. So, uh, if if guardianships are granted far too easily, uh, if there is not this observation of uh, the difference between an individual who has a disability and an individual who has who is incapacitated under the statute. If there's not a difference between those two things, that's a problem, right? And so that can lead to uh, unnecessary or unjustified uh, institutionalization. It could lead to segregation from the community. Uh, it could lead to isolation and uh, severe health outcomes because of that. So lots of Title II issues exist in the realm of, of guardianships, uh, and especially in the realm of whether or not 
They should be limited or terminated if the individual wants to. Back to the continuum of decision-making supports. Um, Abby, how much time do we have? I apologize for bothering you because... We've still got 20 minutes. Very well, okay. So, 25 minutes uh, back, okay. And, and I wanna make sure folks have plenty of time to ask questions. So back to the continuum of decision-making supports, we can talk a little bit about one that there's no statutory, uh, there's no statutory support for here in Arkansas. <clears throat> there was a bill proposed a, uh, back in 2021 that did not make it through uh, that would codify supported decision-making. Uh, many other states have enacted laws that codify supported decision making. Uh, some states, their higher courts have uh, have authorized supported decision making as a function, whether it's based on uh, Title II concerns uh, or some other uh, some other mechanism that would allow folks to retain their own decision-making authority, but still give another person the authority to assist them with making those, those decisions. Um, supported decision-making is endorsed by uh, many professionals in the field of social sciences and psychology and psychiatry. Uh, it's endorsed by the American Bar Association uh, and the, uh, the Uniform Council on Guardianship uh, it allows individuals to still have their own authority to make decisions, but it gives another person access to information they need in order to be able to help them. And this makes sense, right? I, I, I don't do my own taxes, right? I need somebody to help me make decisions about uh, uh, tax benefits and tax liabilities. I, I do not have the ability to uh, understand uh, everything that I need to for tax purposes. So I rely on somebody else to help me make those decisions. It's that concept, but broken down uh, even more. And to say that somebody might not have a great understanding of what they need to ask at a doctor's office about their health care. Uh, are they able to explain uh, uh, questions that they have, or do they need somebody to assist them with that? Is somebody better at explaining to them in a way that they can understand it to help them be able to make their own decisions? This is helpful because instead of a power of attorney, you're not handing over the ability uh, to make decisions to somebody else. You're making all of those decisions yourself on your own. Okay, so uh, the person is not going to be able to make decisions on your behalf. They're not going to be able to open a bank account in your name without your knowledge and without you making that decision. They can help you with that. Uh, and just as with guardianship, just as with powers of attorney, just as with uh, any other type of decision making support, um, it doesn't prevent criminal acts from happening, but it uh, it reduces the likelihood of that happening because of this function of their making their own decision. They're broad, right? Uh, they should come in many different forms. It does look a lot like a power of attorney, but not granting decision-making authority. Um, some of these quotes are from court decisions in other states, uh, calling it a paradigm, not a process or a program going through and determining what will it take for an individual to make their own decision. Do they just need it to be explained? Do they need it in a different format? Um, that might be all that is necessary. Court decision-making was not passed in Arkansas. Um, that was in 2021. Uh, so we don't have one of these laws that exist, but like I said, uh, it doesn't it doesn't prevent folks from looking at them. And if an individual who is under a guardianship uh, wants to engage in one of these activities, uh, I don't know that the law would prevent them from doing that. Uh, more, I don't want to run out of time. So uh, we've got more quotes from uh, organizations like the Administration on Community Living uh, within the, the Department of Health and Human Services. 
in the federal government. Uh, they fully support preserving the right for uh, self-determination and supported decision-making. Um, like I said, the American Bar Association does. Um, we've, I've got a whole presentation separate from this. It's just on supported decision-making. Uh, but why would you do it? Um, it goes back to that, that self-control, uh, control over your life, um, giving people agency, uh, just like when folks are just not under guardianship in the first place, they are more independent, they're more likely to get a job, they're more likely to keep a job. And really importantly, if somebody is making their own decisions and has the opportunity and, and the ability to advocate for themselves, they can recognize and resist abuse. So not just are we, are we seeing states that use supported decision-making uh, have, uh, have better health outcomes, but they're seeing less abuse as a result of it because there is that, that agency that exists and the opportunity to be able to uh, fully exercise self-advocacy. Uh, it's just more of the same. I wanna talk with the time we have left about uh, psychiatric advanced directive. So that is essentially a, um, in ways it's a health surrogate, in ways it is a durable power of attorney. Um, it is a way to document a person's specific instructions or preferences about future mental health treatment. Um, this has been around in Arkansas for a number of years. Um, at one time, even our Department of Human Services had a form psychiatric advance directive. Um, I don't know if they still have that or not. We actually have, we developed a form psychiatric advance directive uh, complete with instructions that is uh, on our website and available to all of you. Uh, and it is essentially a, a way to, uh, it, well, it's, it's shrouded in this, uh, this informed consent right so it, it is about informed consent it's making sure that an individual uh, understands and recognizes the uh, the importance of informed consent and is in, in a way uh, making their wishes known in writing uh, and takes effect when an individual is determined to be incapacitated or they're otherwise committed um, of course, it has to be uh, executed by somebody who does have capacity at the time that they fill it out, uh, and it just gives them a way to be able to make decisions about what they want or don't want to happen uh, if they do lose capacity. It could be very helpful for somebody who uh, might have uh, periodic uh, uh, mental health crises, uh, might be frequently hospitalized if they have very specific instructions. This is a way to let their providers uh, or their or trusted individuals know what they do or don't prefer. It, it also has the effect of decreasing perceived coercion, right? And so if an individual um, uh, might experience um, a, a crisis that would cause them to feel coerced if they have this ability to make this decision on the front end and be assured that it's going to be followed in some way, uh, unless it's an absolute emergency, uh, that, is, that results in uh, better mental health outcomes and uh, more engaging experience in mental health care. Um, and it can reduce psychiatric hospitalizations. We've observed that even, even in its use in our, in our own state. Um, so it comes from uh, this part of the Arkansas law, 20-6-101, about um, uh, durable health decisions. And some resources about it uh, are available at Bazelon, uh, which is the Center for Mental Health Law and the National Resource Center on Psychiatric Advanced Directives. And we will be posting some stuff about that in our, uh, uh, on our website and on our social media. So be on the lookout for more information about psychiatric advanced directives.
And I blaze through the end there. Uh, this is our contact information. I'm, I'm betting we have uh, a few minutes left if anybody uh, wants to jump in and, and ask any questions about anything that I have or have not covered. If anybody has a question and you'd rather speak it rather than, you'd rather speak it rather than uh, <laughs> uh, text it or type it, then if you raise your hand, I can click, I can scroll over your name and unmute you and you can just tell us what your question is. Mm -hmm. Slide 44, I will go back to that. Charles Bird, I think, uh, you're unmuted now. Hi, Charles. Hey, Thomas. Good to hear from hey, you. how are you? Good. Very informative. Really wonderful. Um, it's, it's actually so. Even in the case of your uh, your situation with the haircut, um, and I, I'm still a little shaky. If if you are the legal guardian, do you have the ability to restrict an individual's ability to do that to get a haircut the way they wanted? Um, I know, obviously, that's not a uh, a great practice or anything I would advocate, but are they legally able to do things like that? Essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's absurd that, that it would go that far. And certainly every time that we have stepped in and said that that should not be available, that, that should not be a decision that they're exercising over an individual. Uh, we haven't done it in a private setting, you know, like a, a guardian at home uh, wants their ward to get a specific haircut uh, and they're taking them to get their haircut. Our, our jurisdiction didn't really extend to that. Uh, but if they're in an, if they're in a institution, you know, we've been contacted by uh, some hospitals or institutions before about guardians who want to exercise that, that very uh, almost micro authority, granular authority uh, and we've been very successful at helping kind of navigate uh, that water so that uh, I, I do not think a court would be happy uh, without really good reason to hear that this person was very firm that they don't want their hair cut this way. Uh, are they legally able to do that until someone tells them no, essentially, until someone tells them no, and uh, they would probably be able to get away with it. Uh, obviously, to the uh, it would be scrutinized by a court is one of the only uh, one of the only remedies that might be available. Are uh, AOC funds available to pay ad litem fees for the individual who is attempting to defend against a guardianship? I do not believe so. I don't believe. Uh, the uh, that AOC has any funding for that. While supported decision making is not the same law, would it be possible for the ward to sign an agreement? Or sorry, while well, supported decision making is not in the law, would it be possible for the ward to sign an agreement for the same? Yes, absolutely, hundred um, percent. If a guardian wants to try to uh, support a decision making, if a ward wants to try support a decision making, there's nothing forbidding that from happening. The only uh, warning to that is um, it probably is lacking in some enforceability. Uh, you can get around that in, in a lot of circumstances by executing uh, authorizations to get access to uh, medical doctors, and but you are kind of left at the mercy of third parties to recognize that decision-making agreement. Um, so yeah, yeah, but you could absolutely, anybody, there's lots of forms available online and we encourage people to try them and let us know if, if, if it's working well or if it's not working at all. We have seen states that have tried supported decision-making uh, and have, uh, have established um, actual offices uh, to ensure that people have this as a uh, as an opportunity. Um, other states haven't. Other states have kind of had this unfunded uh, law, like like we were going to have in Arkansas, and who knows if it would have gained any traction with folks who wanted to use it or not. Um, 
but in states that haven't had some kind of office to promote supported decision-making agreements and to assist people with drafting them, they were not as popular uh, as the ones that actually had one of those offices and helped people with it and promoted it and showed people how to use it and identify people who might benefit from it. But you know, one important thing is um, we did hear a lot uh, from folks uh, when that was going through that were worried um, that supported decision-making would eliminate guardianships. And it doesn't take anything away from guardianships. It doesn't terminate anybody's guardianship. It just gives a different mechanism for folks to use instead. And the same same procedures, same, uh, same uh, discretion is afforded to the court to be able to determine whether somebody needs a guardian or not. They have to go through that same process. If, if the guardianship needs to be terminated, they have to go through that same process. So it really is just two completely separate, separate living beings uh, that can exist in the same world uh, with supported decision-making on the one hand and guardianship on the other. And uh, going in and disturbing a guardianship just because there is uh, this, this new mechanism of supported decision making is never enough to just terminate a guardianship in the first place. So, alas, it did not pass. Jennifer, did you have Jennifer a question? Jennifer Douglas. She may have just accidentally put her hand up. All right. Well, I have a question. Well, Come actually, on. I just, um, <laughs> this is the point that, that I raised earlier when we were talking before the presentation. And I just wanted to see if you could repeat that um, for everybody, because I know that this has come up a lot for me. So I had asked you, I said, do you know anything about this, these physicians who are telling folks that they need to hurry up and get a guardianship before their child with a disability turns 18? Because that sounds like pointless to me or, or you know, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, we we do hear that a lot. Uh, you know, so when somebody reaches the age of majority, if they have a disability, um, are you going to be able to make decisions on their behalf? And obviously, if somebody reaches the age of majority and they don't have a guardian, they're making their own decisions, right? So there are limitations on what a physician can even share with a family member. Doesn't mean they have to have a guardian, right? It doesn't mean you have to take their decision making. You know, I've uh, I'm sure when I was 18 years old, uh, I probably had, I probably should have had some decision-making authority taken away from me. A lot of us probably should have, but uh, there are ways to be able to get access to and help with decisions that adults are going to make, even adults with disabilities. And great, uh, great comment in the chat, teachers tell parents that all the time. And we see that that is true. And it is because uh, there is a concern about when a child reaches the age of majority, they are now in charge of educational decisions, right? So if a kid has an IEP, uh, if they're being served under special education, they, uh, they must uh, be part of their IEP team. And they're the ones who are making decisions about their, their education going forward, which they ought to be if they're 18 years old and they have a disability and they're getting transition services and services through the IDEA, they ought to be able to partake in, in the decision-making process because, I mean, they're, they're adult now, right? And they ought to have their preferences expressed. But there are, again, it doesn't require guardianship in order to do that. You can do that with a limited uh, authorization uh, from your adult child now over educational decisions over medical decisions, um, but it does not require uh, to remove decision-making authority. And what, and what better forum to be able to learn uh, what decision-making authority is would be a, a child in an IEP meeting taking control of their own transition planning and what are they going to do after school? What skills do they need? What vocation do they want to go into? I mean, that's that would be a great time to work on decision-making in a, in a safe 
for them to do it. But yeah, nothing requires a parent to to go get guardianship over over their child just because they have a disability and they're uh, they're in special education. It's just again, you know, it's for the very same reasons that we uh, that my slide that was just titled "Good." You know, there are good things about guardianship. Those third parties, they they want a reduction of ambiguity. They want to know that the person who is making the decision is making the decision. Um, and so that that might be one motivation to ensure that folks uh, folks have that decision maker. One thing we hear a lot from folks, uh, w one thing that we hear a lot from folks with disabilities uh, who uh, who do have a power of attorney, who do have a guardian, who do uh, even have a supported decision making agreement when they go to the doctor's office, they're trying very hard to understand but it's hard when the doctor is talking to your guardian, when the doctor is talking to your power of attorney, or when the doctor is talking to, uh, talking to the, uh, the, the uh, supporter in a supported decision-making agreement, and they want to be talked to. They want to have uh, uh, information about their health. They want to be able to ask questions. Uh, and lots of times that communication, if the person is not their own decision maker, that communication is not happening with them. So, do see a raised hand again. Leah, did you have a question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, yeah, I just, I, I appreciated that question. I was just going to say briefly because um, not only am I an attorney, but I'm the parent of a kiddo with a severe disability. Um, and I'm also married to a doctor, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I see this issue in a lot of different ways. That a lot of my friends who have parents or who have kids with disabilities absolutely think that the second that their child turns 18, that they absolutely have need to have guardianship in place, or that they won't even be able to take their kid to the dentist or take their kid to the doctor. They they really kind of live in fear of this. And I can tell you, um, my kid is 18, and I've taken him to appointments. We've we've not done guardianship, um, and you know I have not had any problem. And I can tell you that my husband sees this a lot as a as a physician. There have been numerous instances where there's been an adult child with a severe disability, and they are not able to even provide information about their own health care. And my husband is not at all in the business of saying, where are your guardianship papers to these parents when they are in the hospital with their sick kid? You know, he communicates with them quite freely. Nobody is, is asking, you know, have, has your child signed paperwork or have you done guardianship? You know, it's just, it's never an issue. Not to say that it, it couldn't be with a different position, but, you know, medical practitioners in our experience you know, are real people <laughs> who are going to communicate freely with the people who are able to communicate about this person and their needs and, and their health care and all of that. Great point. I just thought I'd yeah. throw that in there. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. I see the same thing with schools too. So we, um, we've got about two more minutes before we're out of time. Um, Thomas, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, just a just a plug for ourselves. I would say, you know, we we work in a lot of different areas. We're a nonprofit. We're small, uh, but you know, we we investigate abuse, neglect, exploitation. Uh, we our priorities are on our website. Um, we welcome uh, the opportunity to provide technical assistance. Uh, I've assisted attorneys with um, issues related to the ADA that might be ancillary to the cases that they're working on. I've, you know, I've provided advice and consultation on a lot of different issues. Um, we, uh, we like doing this work. Um, and it, uh, it's, it, I, my attorneys and advocates would be uh, uh, shaking their head with the thought of me giving them even more work, but we all just like it so much uh, that we want to hear from you and we want to uh, we want to know how we can help. And uh, in turn, 
if anybody is looking for opportunities to do pro bono work, whether it is uh, education cases, which we are constantly inundated with, uh, or guardianship cases, which we're getting more and more of the more we do them, uh, or other areas that you might have interest or specialty in, please reach out to us because um, not all of the folks that we that we help are going to be eligible for legal aid or Center for Arkansas Legal Services, um, and it uh, it is hard to find uh, find an attorney uh, in our state uh, if you have a disability and you might uh, you might not have uh, the funds or the ability to explain what your what your problem is what your issue is what you need help with and we're happy to help facilitate any of that if we can